welcome back to the Wednesday night service. We're going to continue our study tonight in the book of Daniel. Uh, but first, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we are so grateful and thankful uh, for another day to serve you. We pray tonight that you would be with those names that we've discussed on our prayer list. Pray you'll continue to be with Sterling uh, to, through his chemo treatments. Pray that you'll be with Brother Bernalis there in the Philippines as he's recovering. We pray for the families of those that were involved in this accident tonight. Just pray that you would uh, help the families and comfort them during this time. And Father, I pray for our service this Sunday as we have our uh, soup and salad and sandwich fellowship for Thanksgiving. And just pray that you would send us more visitors. We thank you for the visitors that were here last week. And just pray now that you'll bless our time in your word tonight. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we are starting in chapter number 5. I'm looking forward to getting to chapter number 7, but we got a couple of chapters before that. But chapter number 5, we're going to be introduced to Belshazzar, a new fellow, new king, new ruler. Uh, this chapter only gives us a glimpse of him and his uh, reign in the Bible. As a matter of fact, this particular ruler, uh, it wasn't until late in history that they even had anything in the worldly history books about him. And so many tried to say that the book of Daniel wasn't true because there was no legitimate stuff supposedly about Belshazzar, but uh, there is. And so uh, the Bible doesn't need to go verify itself by secular means anyway. It's God's word. We know it's true. And so that's what we will study. But he was, uh, Nebuchadnezzar died in 562 B.C., and uh, later on, Nabonidus, Nabonidus, I looked that up, it's hard. Nabonidus then became king in 560 B.C. He was the son-in-law of Nebuchadnezzar and the father of Belshazzar. And there's a whole bunch of other names that I'm not going to try to pronounce tonight. And so he ruled from 556 B.C. to 539 B.C., uh, at the fall of the Babylonian Empire, uh, and he was the actual last king of the Babylonian era before the Medes and the Persians came in and conquered. So the Babylon Empire, um, it was kind of like Nabonidus ruled the Babylonian Empire, and Balazar ruled the area of the city of Babylon. Uh, back in that day, they were, it's called Corgin. There was two rulers. And, of course, all through the study, we've already seen that kind of laid out with Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 2, remember, Daniel was honored by Nebuchadnezzar and made to be the second ruler in the kingdom. Daniel 2.48, then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. So while Nebuchadnezzar was the main ruler, Daniel was in second place and ruled with him. And then here in Daniel chapter number 5, verse number 29, it says, Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And so, and we'll see this in our studies ahead, but he was named the third ruler, obviously Belshazzar being the second ruler, and Belshazzar's dad being the main ruler. And so back in that era, they had that share of, of rulership, I guess you could call it. And so, um, so that's how it went. And it's been that way through history back in then. We don't have that today. We have one ruler and one vice ruler, and, and if the ruler goes, the vice ruler steps up, Lord help us. And so, but anyway, that's the way we're set up. And so, uh, we looked on one at the party. You got Belshazzar as, as the point, and then point A is the party. Verse number one. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. And so, we're introduced to Belshazzar, and we get to introduce to him as a, a drunk. Uh, he's having a party, throwing a party for all his lords, a thousand of his lords, uh, kind of like a lot of people are. They eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die. And so they weren't thinking anything. They were living the life, enjoying the life, uh, gratifying the flesh, drinking alcohol and partying. You see that a lot going on today. Um, 
You've seen it back in the days of Noah. The Bible says the Lord will come back as it was in the days of Noah. And in the days of Noah, they were marrying, giving, married, and they didn't care. They were just having an enjoying life. Didn't care that there's this big boat being built or why it's being built or what's going to happen. Until, the Bible says, until the flood came and swept them away. And so uh, they party, they play for a good time. Now, the world that we live in today is the same way. But they never realize that there's coming a day when the party's going to end and the fun is going to end. Now, the world today, uh, they don't believe that God's coming back. They don't believe in God, so they're not worried about it. They're just living their life and doing their thing. But one of these days, you and I are going to pop out of here and disappear and go up in the rapture, and then the tribulation is going to break out and the party will be over. And so, but, but Belshazzar was a man of great wealth and immense power, just like Nebuchadnezzar was. Yet, in his soul, he was like a beggar. He was pretty much poverty-stricken as far as his soul was concerned. Didn't care nothing about the Lord, didn't care nothing about uh, his life or where he would go when he died. He was a great ruler with a vast kingdom, like his father, which his father and father-in-law had left him. Yet he was able, unable to rule his own heart, partying, drinking, having a good time. He was a man who commanded fear from his subjects, but was unable uh, to rule or rule with ignorance uh, because he didn't care. And the thing about that is, is that uh, he didn't realize that there was a higher ruler than him. And so he had no fear for the Lord, but he wanted his subjects to fear him. And the Bible makes it very clear that you and I need to not fear man who can do nothing to us, but fear the Lord who could send our souls to hell. And so he, he walked among the wisest of men. He was very rich, yet he ruled in ignorance because we'll see it in our next study, but he just wasn't very bright. I mean, he was just very, not very bright. So in a night of drunkenness and debauchery, as we'll see in verse number one, and they drank wine before the thousands. Uh, it speaks a lot about substance abuse. Now, my dad, before he got saved, was an alcoholic. So I can kind of understand the scenery here. But whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs, whatever it may be, uh, substance abuse and, and all that accompanies it is a, a tough thing. Uh, Proverbs 20 and verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Ephesians 5.18, we all know, and be not drunk with wine, where it has excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. And I heard a preacher this week talking about that verse, saying that uh, when you see a person that is drunk with wine, you see that the wine takes total control of them. And that's what he said we ought to do, is the Holy Spirit ought to have total control of us. Uh, just like wine has control of a body. And so, Belshazzar knows that on the outside of the walls, they are encamped about with the Medes and Persians. They're getting ready to, to take them, and we'll see this in later study. But he's not bothered by it. Now, I thought this was interesting. He felt like nobody could penetrate and get into the city. The walls were 300 feet high, uh, 85 feet thick. There's no way any army's going to climb up those walls and, and get in, even if the army had surrounded the fenced people. Belshazzar was not bothered because the river that ran through it provided the water that they needed, and they had stored up uh, enough food in the city to be self-sufficient. They even had farms and livestock in the city so that they could keep from starving. So he wasn't worried, didn't think that anything could happen to him. Uh, so he had confidence in himself, and he had confidence in his achievements. Do you remember anybody that he's related to, like a grandpa uh, that maybe had a gold, a big statue that he bragged on, look what I've done, look what I've built, look, 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 look. And that's the, the sin that God hates is pride. And so he's just like that. He's bragging about all his accomplishments. Not only is he bragging, he's throwing a party. But Psalms 118.8 says, now listen to this carefully, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And a lot of times we put our confidence in man. And so he's so confident in himself, he's throwing a party and getting everybody drunk. Now that sounds a lot like the world today, does it not? Uh, they party, they live life, uh, they think they're safe in their houses, 
No one's going to hurt them. No one's going to harm them. They have no thoughts about eternity or where their soul is going to be when they die. They are confident that they are okay. They have no need for God. Uh, many of them call themselves atheists. They just don't even believe in God. And so they're going to do their own thing, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow they shall die. Uh, they're having the time of their lives. They're partying and going on. But one of these days, the time is coming that God is going to declare war on them. Called the seven-year tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And so we can give them the gospel. We can tell them over and over again what's going to happen. But they don't believe it. They don't want to hear it. They want to party. And so uh, one of these days, it's going to come on them before they know it. Now, as the wine begins to circulate, Belshazzar sets the pace. Tasting it, savoring it. Oh, this is such good wine. Passing it around. And he's got this big surprise waiting for the guests. They don't know it. Uh, but but it, it just relaxing and partying and having a good time. It's like, man, he's just he's just brought us here and got us drunk, wants to tell us something. Now next week we'll see the handwriting on the wall, but for tonight, <laughs> literally. So he's like a, a schoolboy getting ready to make an announcement. Secondly, point B, the preposterousness. The preposterousness. Let me spell it. Sure. P R E P. O-S-T-E-R-O-U-S-N-E-S-S. -E Preposterousness. i got to throw in some big words now and then, amen? Verse number two. It's very preposterous. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines my drink therein. Now these are the holy vessels of God. Verse 3. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God. And I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to get near those things. Now they're bringing them out to, to party with. Which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes and wives and concubines drank in them. Now that's preposterous. <laughs> but Babylon is the birthplace of the capital city of idolatry. Uh, I mean, they worshipped idols. They worshipped other gods. We saw it with Nebuchadnezzar. The tell everybody at the sound of the music to bow down. The three Hebrew children would not bow. And, and the idols that they had and all those things, that's where it came from. And it spread throughout the world. And it's it's in the world today, is it not? Uh, a lot of it is deeply was deeply back then rooted in Romanism. And, and uh, a lot of Buddhism and Hinduism come out of that. It flourished in Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, as we've already studied and seen. And it's going to reach its climax in Jerusalem in the days of the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 14, verse 8 through 15. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she hath made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that are kept the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud... One sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And so, you notice it goes back to the wine and, the, and everything 
like we have here in this chapter. And so um, the idolatry and everything in these days is here in the world that we live in today. And it will be all the way up through the tribulation. And so his dad uh, committed adultery. He had all the idols uh, around Babylon on the walls and stuff, hoping to keep the enemy out, hoping that the idols would protect them. Uh, probably had them inside around the banquet hall uh, just, just to honor the idols and to go to have them there for protection. Now, you and I today, we have the Holy Spirit of God. We don't need idols. But there are those that wear things around their neck and stuff and their money and their jobs and what have you that, that they worship, even today. Uh, his grandfather, if you remember, in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 29, made the decree to give respect to the God of the Jews and to worship the God of the Jews. Daniel chapter 4, verse 37, we saw last week, he praised the Lord uh, for the sovereignness and the greatness after he'd come out of his seven years of living like an animal. And so uh, as the years passed, the king, king Nebuchadnezzar's words and his wishes uh, have all been forgotten and forsaken by his grandson Belshazzar. And so they treat the God of Israel with arrogance and with disrespect, and they do the same thing today. There's no respect for God in the world today. People are arrogant. They think there is no God. They're going to go through life without God. They don't need God. They don't want God. And they don't like us people who do want God. And so in the drunkenness, they're attempting to show their superiority. Bring in those vessels. Let's drink out of those vessels. And they're trying to mock God and to put God down. And, and the more drunk they got, the more they ridiculed God. And the more they stomped on God. And a lot of people still do that today. You look around us, uh, the things of God, the way they treat God, the way they talk about God, uh, the way they talk about the Bible, about the church, about you and I, uh, the Lord's Day. They take the Lord's name in vain. I mean, you can see it everywhere. Just like it was in this day. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7 says, Thou shalt not take the name of my Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. And so all these folks are going to stand the great white throne judgment one of these days. And what does it say? The Lord will not hold them guiltless. And so they will suffer for all of that. And lastly, thirdly, the profanity. Now, while these drunken idolaters are drinking from the Lord's cup, they're praising all their false gods. Look at verse number 4. And they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass and of iron and of wood and of stone. Now you remember Nebuchadnezzar's image? It was gold and silver and metal and wood and stone. And so they're praising those gods here as they're drunk. They're just praising all their gods. And so Exodus Chapter 20, verse 3, 4, and 5 says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So don't be worshiping that bass you got up on your wall. That you. And there are some that do that, amen? amen. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And so God is very serious that he is a holy God. We're not to take his name in vain. We're not to worship other idols. And it, anything that we put ahead of God becomes an idol. Right. Because God demands to be number one. He says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So Belshazzar uh, is bowing down to the gods of Babylon and mocking the great God of the Jews. Now his father, grandfather did the same thing at first until the three Hebrew children and until Daniel interpreted the dreams and everything. So the, the great hall of Babylon uh, rang with cheers and jeers with all the drinking and the silver cups and the gold cups and the, the mocking of God through all the thousands of lords that were drunk. And so, uh, and as the wine makes its rounds, and I guess they woke up the next morning with hangovers. My dad always did. But the more drunk they got, the more they derided God. And the more they honored their, uh, their false gods and became hoarse with screaming and celebrating. And here's the thing. People can defy the will of God. They can blaspheme God and blaspheme his name only for so long. In the days of Noah, what happened? The flood came. 
uh, at the Tower of Babel, what happened? The languages were changed. And so we see it all throughout uh, history. Uh, and one of these days, the hand of God is going to come down. Now, next week, we'll see the writing on the wall, literally. And so, uh, but, but Belshazzar has no regard for God. And he, he has no regard for uh, the God of his grandfather, or the God of Daniel. But we're going to find out next week that Daniel comes through once again. Amen. And God uses him because Daniel had character and stood for God. Daniel, remember in the beginning, had purpose in his heart not to defile himself. And you and I tonight, we need to have the same purpose. We need to purpose in our hearts that we're not going to let the world defile us or do anything to us. We are going to stand for the Lord. Because God said that he would never leave us nor forsake us. If God will take care of the three Hebrew children in Daniel, what do you think he'll do for us if we take a stand for him like they did? That's where we got to get. That's where the faith comes in. Amen? Father, we thank you tonight for your, your work. We thank you for uh, what we can learn from Belshazzar and the life that he lived. And that the party crowd is not the crowd to be in. But that you are God and that you are true. And that one day they will all bow down to you and confess that you are Lord before going to the judgment seat of Christ where they will be judged for all these things that they have done. I pray that you will help us to stay true to your word. And I pray that you will help us to be a light in this world to those that are like Belshazzar and the crowd that he was partying with. And we'll give you all the praise for it. In Christ's name, amen.